morning. Woo, happy new year. Feels like it's been forever, right? I missed you guys, and that's awesome. That's how it should be, right? It's so much better than the alternative, like, oh, it's that time again. We get to go see our church friends. I'm so excited to be here. Today is our reset, and that song you just sang was no accident. Jason and I have been planning this for a couple weeks. It is perfect. It is the scripture that we are actually diving into today. So as we start, I'm going to need your help. We're going to solve a riddle. Not counting Atari, what Japanese company, fledgling startup in the 80s, was struggling to get a toehold in America? Don't say it. Don't say it out loud. Okay, we're going to solve this together. In 1980, there was a hit in Japan, and it was called Radar Scope, and it was this full-size arcade. Remember, arcades were starting to really blow and go around 77, 78, all the way into about 83. You could find them in every mall. Anybody ever been to one? Yeah? Ooh, anybody put more quarters than they care to admit into one? Yes, I see that hand. Confession is good. The altar is open. <laughs> this, is, this is the story of what was seeming to be a perfect surefire hit, Radar Scope, in Japan was blowing and going. It was so, so huge of a hit that this startup company that shall not be named yet said, let's crack into America. If we can get this game into America, we will finally have the brass ring. We will get into all those arcades, those 3,000 arcades that are all over the country. That is the market we need to tap. So without batting an eye, they ordered their own company to go out on a limb, extend themselves into debt, and create not 1,000, not 2,000, but 3,000 full-blown stand-up arcade units of Radar Scope. It's only one problem. Radar Scope stunk. And it was not a hit in America. It was a total flop. But it was too late. They had already shipped 3,000 of these arcade units, and they were sitting on a dock in New Jersey in this giant warehouse. And no one was buying. To make matters worse, the notes started coming due in Japan, and they they were hurting financially. And they needed a hit. And they needed one fast, because just making it in Japan alone wasn't going to save the company. So they sent out a desperate press release to all their employees. We need ideas. We are out of ideas, and we got nothing. So it's a contest. Whoever gets this, all expense paid trip, just bring us your best ideas and we we will launch it into production. And they heard crickets. Nothing. One new guy who had just joined this company, he didn't even have any video game experience, comes up and goes, boss, I got an idea. I don't know if you're going to like it, but... I'm kind of thinking, I know America, and I know their values, and I know what they're into, and you see Hollywood, you see their movies, and they're all about one thing. It's the typical theme of good guy rescues damsel in distress from the villain, and it's it's been working for 100 years in Hollywood. Why don't we do a video game like that? But we'll do a new take on an old theme. Executives were out of ideas, so they all leaned in and said, tell us more. Tell us more, oh, 19-year-old wizard. Tell us more. And he said, well, why don't we do a little switch with it? We'll make... The good guy, an everyday man. And we'll make the villain something different. We'll make a villain an animal. How about a giant gorilla? We'll call the hero an everyday name. And they looked, and sweeping the floors in the warehouse was a guy. And they said, what is your name, sir? His name, I kid you not, was Mario. What was the name of this company? Nintendo, what was the name of the game that they came up with? (laughs) Donkey Kong. Raise your hand if you played it. Yes, okay, all right. I can't stand this game. I never got past like the first frame, you know, in the little fireballs. It was, oh, just, it tests your religion. This game had an even better hit because this guy said, boss, I haven't even told you the best part of this. All we need to do is reset the video game. You, 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 have, you have my attention, young 19-year-old. Why don't we keep the monitors? All we'll do is redo the artwork. We'll keep the buildings the same, the, 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 the wooden structures we built. We'll put in new artwork. We'll leave the wiring harness. We'll just take the monitors and we'll turn them sideways. Instead of the game always playing boring left to right like the spaceships flying and all these things, we'll turn it so the game will now play from bottom to top. And we can reuse everything. This was such a huge, it saved them so much money. This went on to be their biggest hit to date and spawned a franchise of Super Mario games that would go on to be their biggest hit. And it was all due to a simple reset. It saved them from certain doom and made their company to where they are one of the most profitable video gaming things to date. All because of a little guy had a bold idea of going back to the basics, putting a new twist on it and resetting it. 
And that's what this series is about. Resetting our hearts. That's where we're going to start today. It is so, what a reset is, is anything that's not quite functioning optimally, you reset it. That's what you do, right? I'm not the first one to come up with this. Every computer has that little reset button. What do you do when your iPhone starts getting a little sluggish? And you guys got 73 apps open, running in the background, right? You know what I'm saying? And it's struggling just to tell you the weather. You, re- you get an Android, right? No. <laughs> Boo. Wow. Off the rails. This is what you do. You reset it. And I'm not the guy who came up with this. this. Churches all over the country are doing resets because the new year is a great time to go beyond New Year's resolutions and to reset. I first heard about this theme back in July when a young evangelist named Nick Hall felt a burden and a passion for the next generation to live boldly for God like never before. And what he did is he called everybody who could get to the National Mall to come up and pray. And it ended up being a crowd so massive that it is actually being called the third great awakening in America. And he, he had this burden for it, and it's going out. It's touch. I mean, Francis Chan got behind it. Kerry Joby got behind it. All these people got behind it and started pushing this. And, and it's finding its way into churches. And the whole goal is so simple, we dare miss it. To reset simply means this, to set something back, to restore it to its original design. And that is what we're going to do today. And it, before we can reset our minds and our hands and our mouths and our marriages and our finances and all those things that need to be done, You have to begin with the heart. And that is what we look at. Today, we need a full-on reset of the soul. We're going to find out what happens when you start going God's way with total surrender instead of going our own way. Because if you're like me, you've done that. And life is exhausting. And it is tiring. And we were meant for so much more than just enduring and getting up and going to work and punching the clock and coming home and going to bed and getting up and going to work and punching the clock and coming home and going to bed and getting up and going. There's got to be something more. There has to be. There's got to be a purpose for getting out of bed, something you're excited for your feet to hit the ground, and that more we're craving is Jesus. And you know, if you don't know that, all today is going to be the most awesome day for you, and you're going to have the best sleep you've ever had when you let God reset your heart. So if you're with me, turn to James or Psalms chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6, Psalms chapter 24. While you do that, let me welcome those who are streaming with us online. Good to have you with us. If you are with us online, would you leave us a comment or hit us thumbs up? Just let us know you're out there. We want to know who all is being blessed by this, and we are so glad to have you with us. Everybody got it? Verses 1 through 6, Psalm chapter 24. Read along with me. It says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas, and he established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Wow, that's what we just sang. Most theologians believe that this song was written by David to commemorate him bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to the tabernacle, the place that he had prepared for it. He was so excited about this that he wrote this song, and he gave us this this caution about you better have clean hands and pure heart, and you better not be swearing to false idols and and falling off the the, the truck here and, and letting your heart go after every little thing, which is so easy to do. Now, we want to look just a little bit at the Ark. For those who are maybe new to the faith, we got a lot of people who are checking this out. What is the Ark? It had been built hundreds of years before David sang this song. And it was built by God's design, telling under Moses' direction to go find two artisans, two master craftsmen. Now, this is pretty awesome. What they did is Moses went and tapped two people who were gifted in building beautiful things. There's two names, and and if you can guess any of them, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. The first one was a hard name to pronounce called Bezalel, son of Uri. Bezalel, son of Uri. It's in Exodus chapter 31. Anybody know the second one? Anybody? Give you a hint. This one here on the right, Harrison, son of Ford. Does anybody remember that, right? There is another artisan. His name's way too hard to pronounce. You can look it up in Exodus 31. But we have these two artisans who were given intense, detailed instructions of how to totally build this according to God's demand. 
made of acacia wood, covered in pure gold. It was absolutely incredible. The ark is just a fancy name for box, but it was so much more than just a magic box. God said, build this, and this is going to be the symbol of my promise to you and my presence. Look at this next one here. This, I won't even go into what happens on the top, the mercy seat. Oh, my goodness. This is a whole other sermon. But what happens here is so amazing when you grasp what God was saying with this box. He was literally saying, this is my promise to you. This is my divine deal. I will give you a covenant. You'll be my people, and I will be your God. And he would protect them, and he would provide for them. If they would just obey his laws, he would bless them. Okay, well, that sounds pretty sweet. Sign me up for that. Here's the problem. The opposite of this divine deal was equally true. And that is, if Israel got distracted, or the devil came and started to tear that heartbeat for God away and show them other things and lesser things and idols and gods to bow to, then they would lose the blessing of his protection. They would lose all the divine things again, and they would be subject to the natural consequences of sin. The natural consequences that when we go our own way will come. And just like a lot of us sitting in this room, the Israelites had to learn this the hard way. And they had to learn it over and over. Now, let me tell you the backstory here as we dive in. David's returning the ark, and he's returning it to Jerusalem. He's got a special place prepared for it, and he's so excited. He brings it back, and he's singing this song, Who can ascend the hill? The Lord who's got clean hands and pure hearts. And he's so happy, and he's excited, and he's bringing it up, and he's giving this warning, don't, don't go back and fall into trusting in idols and swearing to false gods. And he's got this beautiful song, and then something happens. The Israelites find their old rival. They have been fighting with a particular group century after century, it seems. Anybody know the name of their bitter rival that just keeps going after them? That's right, silence. No, the Philistines. They have battle after battle. Their most famous one involved a giant. Anybody remember the giant's name? Say it with me. Carlos. What? No. Okay, yes, yes. Archie. No. The giant's name was Goliath. Good job, good job. Got to keep the children with me engaged. Now, this, this rivalry was awful for Israel. They, the, the Philistines were their bit, put it this way, if the Israelites were Carolina, the Philistines were Duke, okay? You, yeah, now you get it, right? If the Philistines were Clemson, the Israelites were Alabama, right? You know what I'm saying? Moment of silence as we mourn the loss of Alabama. God bless, okay. All right. I'm not bitter, I'm okay. If, if the Israelites were the Cowboys, Philistines were the Redskins, okay? It was that they couldn't stand each other. They were, they were wanting to destroy each other. And it kept coming back to back. These guys went into battle no less than seven huge battles. One particular battle that we look at today went horribly bad for them. They engaged in this fight, and within a matter of hours, 4,000 Israelites were slaughtered. They lost 4,000 in one skirmish. So the Hebrew leader said, retreat, come on back. And they were disillusioned. And they were so down and, and, and wondering what's going on. You know, has God abandoned us? They tuck their tails and they come back and they're having a meeting. And an idea sweeps through the camp. And it is a terrible idea. But it swept through the camp nonetheless. And that was this. Guys, wait a minute. What are we doing? We've got the Ark of the Covenant. We've got God's holy golden box, the magic box, the lucky charm. We, all we got, this represents God's victory over our enemies. This represents his promise. We, what are we doing? We'll just trot out the ark at the front of the line and let God annihilate them. There's only one problem. God's not a genie, and that's not a lucky charm. God is not Santa Claus, and he does not have to bend to, to indulge anyone's selfish will to crush our rivals. See, in that moment, this beautiful symbol of God's presence and his power went from being the covenant to being that genie in a bottle, and they missed it. And their hearts still had a little bit of rebellion. So they go off, and they, they say, we're just going to bring this out, and we're going to say, God, show off. It's your time. Kill them all. Blow them away and take care of it. You know, we, I know we've kind of been ignoring you. We've been kind of had wandering hearts, but we're really serious about this, God. We're just going to set you out there and just do your thing. Jazz hands. And guess what happened? Not only did the battle go even worse, they lost 30,000 soldiers. 30,000 Israelites killed. That's not even the bad part. The bad part is the Philistines captured 
that. They took it. They surround it and capture it and take it back to their cities. Unbelievable. It couldn't have gone worse for the Israelites. Now, we don't ever do that. We don't ever say, God, show up. I know I haven't been living for you, but do your thing, Lord. And then they're shocked, and we're shocked when he doesn't show up and show off and rescue us. See what happened? They made some poor choices. And again, we, we don't do that. We don't ever make bad choices and we're dismayed and maybe a little angry at God. God, you, why didn't you deliver me from this? You know, I know I made some really poor choices. Y'all remember the other Indiana Jones movie where he, he says, quite frankly, he chose poorly. They chose poorly, and we do too. And it's not God's fault. When we go our own way and we depart from his blessing, we come untethered from his provision, and then we're shocked that he doesn't just show up and blow people away. So these guys take the ark, the bad guys, the Philistines, and they go put it in their temple. Their temple was worshiping a false, huge, evil idol called Dagon. Dagon was bad news. This was a huge stone structure that they had built. It had been there for hundreds of years in this big, ta- this big temple. And the Philistines take God's holy golden covenant, the Ark of the Covenant, set it in there, and they go away. They come back the next morning, and guess what's happened? Dagon has fallen over and is laying on his face in in almost a posture of bowing before the holy ark of God on his face. The Philistines, though, didn't get it, okay? They were a little prideful. They weren't about to think that, well, surely the God of Israel was not the real God because we worship Dagon. So, rather, get the guys, they had their leadership team come, and they picked it up, and they stacked it back up, and they stood it up, and they went away. Next morning, they come in, Guess what they find? Not only has Dagon fallen back over on its face, but Dagon's head has broken off and his arms have broken off. As if God said, I will not share my glory with another. If you want clean hands and a pure heart, the first step, we do not share God's glory with another. We are not to be an adulterous people. God is a jealous God. For what? For our worship. Are you kidding me? What do you give the God who has everything? The only thing he won't take by force. Our hearts, our worship. And that is what we find ourselves today. When when, when these bad guys took that ark and they set it in there, their pride was so, so profound, so deep, they didn't even get it that God was doing this. They started to get tumors and rats started overrunning their cities. And they said, well, that's just a fluke, no big deal. And this went on for seven months. Finally, they said, ship it to the other cities. Well, how about some of these other ones? Let's, let's see what happens. Guess what happens? Rats started to crawl out of the sewers, uh, overran the cities. Tumors and sores started popping up. This went on for, for months. Finally, in their pride, they said, get rid of this thing. And they send it back to Israel. And guess what happens to their tumors and their sores and the rats? They disappear. There is a huge lesson in here for us. So how does this apply to us today? What was true for the Israelites back then is just as true for you today. God made them in his image, just like us. He made them with a purpose, just like us. He gave them a a promise to bless them, to use them for his glory, to equip them with spiritual gifts, to accomplish things for his kingdom, just like us. And then he said, on top of that, I will give you purpose, and I will give you protection, and I will keep those evil, nasty enemies away from you, and all the satisfaction and joy and fulfillment you can have. All you have to do in exchange, this great great divine duty. Remember what it was? We had to do the exchange? Simply let God be God in their lives. That's it. That was the divine deal that he promised. That's what this box symbolized. If you just let me be God in your lives, your life will go so much more according to the plan. If you will trust me, all the fulfillment, all the satisfaction, all the joy, all the peace, everything we want every day, we would provide. We'll even take care of those mean-spirited enemies. Everything they could ask for, and in exchange for all of it, all what was required was for a heartfelt yes. That's it. Wow, that's awesome. Yes, God, you can be God. Yes, God, you can chart my course. Yes, God, you can pave my path. You can meet my needs. And yet, yes, wasn't what the Israelites said. What? And we look back from our lofty perch, and we look down our nice noses at them and say, are you stupid? What are you thinking? How could you not, why would you not take that sweet deal? But before we get a little too haughty, Look in the mirror, because God offers us the exact same deals. 
And often we judge them and think, why didn't they say yes? Well, before we get too crazy, they didn't exactly say no either, okay? Let's cut them some slack. They didn't say, no, you can't be God. We don't like you. No, you can't feed us manna from heaven. You call this food. They, They didn't say any of that. What they said was far worse. They didn't say it with their mouths. What they said with their hearts was basically, maybe. To this great offer, God, you can provide for me. You can sustain. You can give me a purpose for life. You can reset my heart. You can take care of my family. You can, eh, maybe. Um, when it's convenient. Oh, you're not going there, are you, Pastor? Yeah. When it's convenient, when it works for me, I will trust in you. When nothing else competes with you, God, I'm, I am yours. I am 68% sold out to you, God. Wow. 69, 70, 71, you know, it's a good week. Things are going good, and th- this, is, this is what they said. Sometimes when it's convenient, so let's just ask us the question. Do you say maybe to giving God our full heart? Do you, not with your words, but with your actions. Because here's how I think it happens. To this great offer that God gives us, this lavish invitation of purpose and acceptance and fulfillment, we say, God, that sounds great. You know what? I'm in. I believe most of us say that. I believe most of us say, yes, count me, that sounds awesome. Sign me up for some of that. And we don't count the cost of being a disciple. We say, yeah, that's awesome, that's great. And then moments later, when something comes along that's distracting to us, or maybe shines with the little pretty silver over here, and we think, ooh, Dory, what's that? Oh, you know, we go over, and we get a little distracted. Or we want something that people who love God aren't meant to want, then we revoke it. When we had just given God the steering wheel, we had just said, you drive. You know what? You're the one. You take it. You, Jesus, take the wheel. Amen. And then we see something that's maybe a little bit more attractive or a little bit more easy. Huh? And we say, can I have that wheel? <laughs> I can do it on my own. We don't say it with our mouths. We say it with our actions. That razzmatazz, that worldly thing, that whatever it is, that relationship, that job, you name it, whatever comes between you, what happens is the devil comes and he says, I know God's told you he would provide your needs. Needs are good. God gives us our needs. They're inbuilt. It's so that we constantly come back and depend on him. He gives us needs. Needs are holy. But Satan comes and says, you know that dependence on God? (laughs) I tried it. It ain't what it's cracked up to be. What you need is independence. What you need is that, but it's a false independence. He whispers these lies, and he has no end to his lies, these cheap substitutes. And he comes up and he says, you need to take control. You see, that thing we're not meant to want is a self-directed life. Ooh, man, this this is not popular. Instead of a God-centered life, right? That thing we're not meant to want is when we try to meet God-given needs with anything that doesn't honor him. When we allow Satan to creep into our hearts, to our marriages, to our bedrooms, to our computers, to our entertainment, to our hobbies, to our work, to everything, and give you something that eh, is a cheap substitute. If you are tired of that life in 2016, 2017 is the year of the reset, where we could say, you know what? What does it look like if I go God's way fully? And stop putting myself on the throne in my heart and start putting Jesus on the throne of my heart and letting his desires become my desires, his will becoming my will. This, this false independence that the devil tries to sell us, how does that come? How does that come? Let's, let's be real. We don't, we don't bow to idols. None of us have a Dagon idol, I hope, right, in our house. If some of y'all, maybe I should, if you got a stone statue in your family room, please see me after church. We're going to talk about it. We're going to pray for you because that's, that, that's not how the devil comes and tempts us today. We have a God-given need for clothing. It's normal. It's natural. The devil comes and he says, you need more. And then it starts to show up in things like overspending and racking up huge amounts of debt. It's never enough. That God-given need that we have for success, for purpose, that's awesome. That's God-given. The devil comes and says, you're still not enough. You're a failure because you haven't reached this goal you set. And then it feeds itself into maybe elbowing your way up the corporate ladder, just a little bit ahead of your buddy, or throwing somebody under the bus, and they know you're a Christian. You see how it happens? Something good, something insidious slips right in with the devil. Or maybe it's something even more deceiving, and, and, and that God-given need for holy companionship. The devil comes along and says, they're not meeting your needs. 
I have a cheap substitute. It's just a mouse click away, right? It's just, you know, just, just, just consume and consume, and it's something that's so fake. And so we get, we get wrapped up into this, and you don't even know how you got there. And before you know it, you can't even relate to your spouse. You can't even relate to a real person. God help the teenagers that are coming up because it is an epidemic, and they don't have a clue how to relate to a real person. And they get married, and they wonder why what they see on a fake fantasy screen doesn't match what's over here, and we're setting them up for failure. Man, it's, all these things are the devil trying to offer a false independence for what God knew we needed all along, sold out, wholehearted dependence, a heart that is reset for him. And that's the only place peace comes from. That's the only place that you find true joy. So God comes and he gives us all these things. I will meet your needs in super mind-blowing, super consistent, supernatural ways. And we say, ah, I'll get back to you. (laughs) What is wrong with us? We don't say it with our lips. We say it with our attitudes. Ah, meeting with the other body of believers. That's, you know, if it's convenient, I'll be there. Serving on a team to help if it's convenient. Reading my Bible, spending time with you in the Lord in the morning, eh, if it's convenient. If nothing better comes up, you know, we, just, you know, we say, we'll get back to you on that. But here's the problem. We don't get back to them until the crisis shows up. Huh? Ooh, it's awfully quiet in here. Happy New Year. This is the thing. This is what happens. We get into this, into this bind, and, and sure, then we, get, we come running for God. We say, God, help me. What? I don't understand what happened. My, my, the, the wheels have fallen off. My world's falling apart. I can't pay this bill. Or teenagers, man, my, my parents found my secret stash. I didn't think they would find it. My girlfriend says she's probably pregnant. There's all these things. I, I, I don't know what to do because my teenager flunked again, and I just got an email that said my company is doing layoffs again. God, where are you? Come help me. I just got the test results back from the doctor, and they're positive. And the IRS thinks they're on to me, and they want to talk to me. Or as in this case, the Philistines just slaughtered 4,000 of our best soldiers. Where are you, God? And we come, and we, something flips our switch, and then, and only then, we trot out our fancy golden box that we've been keeping God in, and we crack the lid and go, you're on. <laughs> go get him, God. And then we have the audacity to be shocked when he doesn't show up and show off, when he is fully within his rights to look at us and go, Maybe. Baby, where you been? It's nice that you came back to me, but how many times are you going to do this dance? You need me? Oh, I, I bet you need me. I've been, I've been right here all along. I've been watching your dance, and I've been wondering, what's taking you so long? Let me reset your heart. These things you're pining for are rubbish. You're splashing around in the kiddie pool, and behind you, I've got the ocean for you to swim in. And you're so interested in little shiny trinkets that don't mean squat. And I've got this great life for you. If you would just let me reset, if you would truly seek me with all your heart, if you would just come to me and and not say, God, be my Santa Claus, God, be my genie, just rub the thing a little harder, maybe he can come out of the golden box and solve this problem. We don't say it with our mouths, we say it with our actions. Here's the problem. God is not obligated to bend to our will. We're supposed to bend to his. Wow, you don't hear that much. God's not our genie. The cost of discipleship is high, and we've made it too easy. We've made it like, just pray a simple prayer and everything's awesome. Tiptoe through the tulips. And, oh, something bad happened in your life? Well, you must not be living right. What? If you just accepted Christ, if you really did, your life is supposed to be a bed of roses. That's not what I read in this book. There are people who give it all to God and the cost of discipleship is high. Are you willing for that? In 2017, how serious are you? Let's just ask. Don't don't say it out loud. How serious are you with your commitment? How serious am I? Are you content with 2016? If you are, change nothing. But if you want to be challenged to take the next step, 
Let God reset your heart and your whole heart, not just 25%, not 80%. Give it all. Say, you know what? I am tired of Mickey Mousing around with you. You take it all. All right, so what does your false independence look like? What is your maybe to God? Because here's the good news, all right? Let's turn the corner. God is inviting us to something so much better than a maybe faith. He is inviting us today to the table to come to have a heart reset, to go from maybe faith to full on, yes, God, you can have it all. Let's see what you can make of this. I bring you my mess. I bring you the good, the bad, the ugly, the stuff no one knows, and the stuff that way too many people know, and I lay it at your feet. Because here's what he says. Here's, <laughs> here's the rub. Are you ready for it? He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. You first. Oh, man, I wish those last two words weren't part of it. But that's the beautiful thing. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. You make the first move. You come, and then if you do, if you take that first step to me, I will be on you like white on rice. You can't shake me. I will be there for you. I will draw close to you. I will steal you forever. I will graft you into the body of Christ, and nothing can separate you. And you have so much to look forward to and a purpose that will rock your mind. So if you're fed up and you're distressed and you've screwed up and you're discouraged and you know you need a reset, take heart. Because David, the guy who wrote the song we just sang, needed a reset too. And he got one. This guy knew about faithlessness. He knew about bowing to idols. We know all about his escapades with Bathsheba. We know all about having Uriah killed. We know all about these things. Yet, when the book was closed and the history was settled, guess what they called him? A man after God's own heart. A guy who could do all that, he still gets that label? Well, that gives me hope. There's hope. This, is, this guy knew about it. He goes on to be called the man after God's own heart because he reset his faith. And not only his generation, but every generation since has been impacted by him. You want some of that? I do. Here's, here's what he says. Here's what he comes down to at the end of Psalm 24. He shows there is one massive benefit. And we sang it, and we don't even realize what it really means. He comes back, and he says, when you take your reset heart from a faith in yourself to a full-on faith in God, then you get these benefits. You have hearts that are clean and pure and hands that are clean and pure. And we get to ascend the mountain of God. We're named among people who actually get to have clean hands and a pure heart and ascend the mountain to come into the presence of God. This is incredible. Do we grasp this? The people who get this, this, everything you're longing for, let's just boil it down. The innocence, the joy, the peace, the laughter, the unshakable foundation when the junk of life comes, and it will. Everything you've been wanting is wrapped up right here and accepting a wholehearted yes and saying, reset my heart. And guess what happens? He shows up and he begins to impart his thoughts into your thoughts. He begins to impart his motives into your motives. His ways become your ways. His responses, his desires. And guess what? Here it is. Here it is. Buckle up. Before long, you resemble him. Enough said. Isn't that the whole point of calling ourselves Christians? You know what Christian means, right? It means little Christ. And we start showing up and we start having these thoughts and we start having these desires and these responses and we're starting to look like Jesus. And before long, people look at you and go, you're a follower of him, aren't you? Because your actions give you away. Oh my good, oh, to be known as a people who look at you and say, oh, you're one of them. You can't deny it. You talk like them, you act like them, your aroma just reeks of a Holy Spirit. And they're either going to be drawn to that, attracted to it, curious, or repelled. And that's okay. That's not your job. Your job is to reflect Christ. And that's what he says. Before you know it, you begin to resemble him. Clean hands, pure heart. Who doesn't want that? We get to come to the greatest place ever, ascend the mountain, and have total, complete joy in 2017. That is the offer that's on the table. So here's the deal. As plainly as I can say this, if you're weary of running from God, if you think there has to be more, you're right. If you think that there is something more for you than, than endless drudgery and tedium and tire and fatigue, there is more. 
And if you are ready to have a mission that matters, to turn from the darkness and the drudgery of sin, if you're tired of the rats and the sores and the tumors, if you're tired of bowing before a false god, of whatever it is, name your Dagon. Today can be the reset. And listen, you won't be the first one. You can have your reset right here today, before you even get in the car. But he said, you first. You make the first move. Jesus is offering the reset. And your response is a simple, wholehearted, yes, God. I wish we'd done it earlier. I wish the Israelites had stayed on that track and then maybe half the Bible wouldn't need to be written, but that's not what happened. Today we have a chance for the reset and it can happen now. So if you're ready to have this, I'm going to have our musicians come. Bow with me. Let's have a moment of prayer. And if you're ready to have this reset in faith, then you tell God that you're after this reset we've been talking about. With every eye closed, focus on the Lord and make this in your way, your heartfelt response. Father, we are done coming up with our own paths. We are done coming up with our own responses, our own cheat methods, our own shiny trinkets that try to satisfy and they never do. Lord, forgive us. God, we are done with that. We are asking now that you receive us and we accept your promise to cleanse us from all sin. Purify us, Lord. Remake us. Reinvent us. Reset our hearts. Here in this moment, Lord, we surrender. We are your children and you are our king. We confess you as Lord, as Savior, as Redeemer, and also now as friend. We draw near to you, God, and we wait you to draw near to us. Give us a fresh glimpse of your holiness, God, of the cost of discipleship that calls us to right living and real change. We love you, God. Thank you for saving us from our sin. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.